Um, hi everyone, I'm Jared. I am a data scientist in the growth team at Deliveroo. So uh, in my team, we work, in, we work on a really wide range of uh, initiatives aimed at growing the business, uh, ranging from marketing channels like performance marketing and CRM, all the way to in-product features and experimentation like Restaurant Marketer, which is our restaurant-facing marketing platform, which allows restaurants to create their own discounts on Deliveroo, uh, all the way to Deliveroo Plus, which is our subscription scheme for consumers. And that's something that I'm going to be speaking a bit more about um, today, specifically how we've gone about measuring the impact of Plus, uh, what issues we've come across, and how we've kind of dealt with them. So does anyone actually know what Delivery Plus is? Has anyone heard of it before? Is anyone signed up? Just the employees who get it for free? OK, cool. Um, <clears throat> so Delivery Plus is our consumer-facing subscription scheme. It's £7.99 a month, and you get access to uh, free delivery on every order and exclusive discounts. So we've been live in the UK for just over a year now, and we've since launched in France, Spain, Singapore, and Ireland. So the primary goal of PLUS is really to increase the order frequency of people who sign up. So we want people to sign up to PLUS, like Kim, and um, feel locked into PLUS. We want them to, to stop ordering from competitors and um, just, yeah, increase their frequency. There's other metrics that we're interested in, of course, like profitability is a very important metric to us, but our primary goal on the consumer side is to increase frequency, so the number of times that people are ordering. Um, so to understand whether PLUS is doing that effectively, we needed to figure out um, how we were going to measure the impact, what experiment approach we were going to take. So usually the first port of call for uh, a new feature at Deliveroo is to uh, A-B test it, particularly on the consumer side where we have a bunch of users to test on. A proportion of users will um, have access to the, uh, to the treatment and of course users won't completely randomize that user level. The reason this wasn't really going to work for Plus is that firstly it's not really a great experience for people to be held back from something as big as Plus. If you were an Amazon user and you couldn't sign up to, to Prime, it's, it's not really a great user experience. And imagine two people, two friends that are both on Deliveroo, one can sign up to Plus, one can't. It's likely that the one who can't is just going to use his friend's account. So it could introduce some learned behavior. So for those reasons, we decided that an A-B test wasn't the best approach for us. Um, the match market approach is one that we've used before to measure the impact of uh, marketing campaigns. So this involves uh, matching cities or zones based on their historical order trends or acquisition trends, depending on what we're trying to drive, um, and uh, measuring the impact at the city level. So this kind of eradicates the issue that we had with the A-B test, because people in the same vicinity will probably have the same treatment. However, it doesn't have much power, so it's really difficult. You have to have a really impactful treatment to shift the frequency at a city level. Um, and the truth is something like Plus, when we launch it, most people aren't going to know about it, even less people are going to sign up. So those that do have to really change their behavior for us to impact the top line metric. So we decided that this also was not appropriate. Um, <clears throat> the step wedge approach is one that's used by some teams at Deliveroo, particularly recently. It's um, essentially you're, you're exposing different cities and zones to the feature over time uh, controlling for that seasonality impact. Uh, and basically the treatment, the treatment group acts as its own control group. Um, this is arguably more powerful than a match market approach. However, with something like Plus, it's not something you turn on and you immediately feel the impact of. It, it grows over time. We need to wait for people to sign up and change their behavior. So something like this would take a really long time for us to, to uh, run and measure effectively. So again, we decided in a fast moving business like Deliveroo, this wasn't going to be appropriate. And another one which is worth mentioning, but one we didn't really consider, but it's used by some teams at Deliveroo when they're struggling with sample sizes. It's the crossover approach, turning the treatment on and off for the same group of users over a period of time. Again, controlling for that seasonality uh, aspect, but with Plus, you can't really turn off a feature that people are paying for. So again, we decided not to go with this. <clears throat> and lastly, the one that we ended up choosing was the post-treatment paired subjects, or lookalikes as we call them internally. So this is quite similar to propensity matching, if anyone's familiar with that. But it involves 
rather than comparing everyone who signed up to Plus to everyone who hasn't signed up to Plus, we're comparing people who signed up to Plus to similar behaving people in the non-treatment group, essentially creating our own control group. So when we weighed these uh, experiment designs up against some of the attributes, the lookalikes or the post-treatment pair subjects was the one that had the most pros. Um, so it's never going to control for all extraneous variables in the way that a randomized A-B test will. It's only going to control for what you're matching on. Um, but as long as you're matching on the thing that you're measuring, that's OK. It, it allows us to track the ongoing um, incrementality. So we're not, as long as we have a pool of users to choose from, we can keep tracking that over time. The user experience isn't compromised, so we're not really holding it back from anyone. We're just matching with people who are in markets where Plus doesn't exist or people who haven't signed up. And it's quite an easy thing to explain to the business as well. Um, and it's also deployable without any engineering effort. So it's, it's currently running a script which r runs each night, which at delivery is, is definitely a Plus. Um, so to go into a bit more detail about what a lookalike actually is, the, the actual definition is an artificial control group created by matching treatment users to non-treatment users based on their attributes. Um, so what does that look like at Deliveroo? So what we do is we pair subscribers with a lookalike user at the point that they sign up to Plus, and that's a, that lookalike has to have the same monthly frequency, so they have to be placing the same amount, amount of orders each month. They have to have the same number of orders on the date that they sign up. So most subscribers, when they sign up, they'll place an order on that date. Um, initially, we had, a, we had an attribute where they had to not be from a plus region. So this was our way of mitigating against selection bias. So we don't really want to pair somebody who's signed up to plus to somebody who has been exposed to plus but hasn't signed up because they don't think they're going to stick with Deliveroo. It's not really a fair match. So we've taken lookalikes from outside of the UK where initially they weren't exposed to plus. Um, they also have to have the same city order frequency. So Deliveroo, Deliveroo service is very different from city to city. Um, so our, our restaurant selection, our service will be very different. So somebody in London who has a frequency of three is not really comparable to somebody in Basingstoke, for example, where our selection is probably not as good. I don't even know if we're live in Basingstoke, but if we were, um, it wouldn't be as good. And somebody who's ordering three times is arguably not a great pair with that person in London. So this was our way of controlling for that product market fit. And once we've matched subscribers with, with lookalikes that meet, meet those um, attributes, we take the one, so it's a one-to-one -one match, um, who has the nearest average order value. So they're ordering a similar amount each time that they place an order. And our assumption is that had that subscriber not signed up, they would behave in the same way as that lookalike. So it's, it's quite a big assumption. Um, and this is an example of what that might look like. Obviously not using actual um, users, just really bad stereotypes. But Dave in Brighton has a frequency of three, AOV of £14.50, and he's matched with Pierre in Nice in France, who has the same frequency and, and a very similar average order value. Um, however, this shows the monthly percentage difference in frequency between subscribers and their lookalikes over time. So you can see that it's really volatile, especially in May to August, it goes up, down, up. And that doesn't really make sense because you would expect somebody to sign up and have a consistent uplift, not suddenly drop off in June. Um, so when you overlay the difference in market level frequencies, so this is, um, at this point we were only live in the UK, so it's the difference in UK level frequency versus the lookalike market frequency, which is a combination of different markets weighted by the lookalikes in each one. You can see that they're very closely correlated. So in August, when continental Europe slows down at a faster rate than the UK for Deliveroo, because people go on holiday um, in continental Europe in August, apparently, we massively overestimate the, uh, the uplift of, of plus. So we're like reporting on these really fluctuating um, metrics and we can't really explain why. So that's obviously a problem. And when you compare those international lookalikes with in-market lookalikes, you can see it's a lot smoother, that volatility is taken away. But by doing that, we're introducing that selection bias that we were trying to avoid. So we're potentially matching with users who've, who don't want to sign up to Plus because they may be a moving country and aren't going to be able to order from Deliveroo. So it's not really a great match, and, and that's probably shown in the increased uh, frequency versus international lookalikes. 
So what we've done in a really hacky way is reduced that. So we've increased the lookalike frequency to calibrate for that um, estimated uh, measure of selection bias. So we've calibrated it so that it's in line with what we've historically seen with in-market lookalikes, but it's just essentially a much smoother version. So it's quite hacky, um, but this is where we are now. So we, don't, we no longer have that attribute, so they now have in-market lookalikes. So Dave is now matched with Bob instead of Pierre, who's from Manchester, also a tea drinker, similar order frequency and average order value. Um, so now that we have our lookalikes, it allows us to calculate our, our key metrics for the business. So you have incremental orders per subscriber per month, which is just a difference in frequency between the subscribers and lookalikes. Similarly, gross profit per month, the difference in gross profit, which allows us to calculate gross profit per incremental order. So this is the gain or loss that we, we get as a business for each incremental order that we're driving through plus, if we're driving any incremental orders through plus. Um, which is really good, but does it actually work? Is this an appropriate control group, or are we just overestimating the impact or underestimating the impact um, and making misinformed decisions? So to understand the answer to that question a bit better, what we've done is um, we've run simulations on historical data. So we have a lot of consumer data. There's, we've been live since 2013, and we have a, a really huge base of users. Um, so what we've done is, is taken a random selection of 200 dates over the past year, and on each of those dates matched, sorry, on each of those dates found a random selection of, of users on each of those who have placed an order. And then we found a lookalike for each of those users based on the criteria I've, I've been through before. And then we've measured the difference in, in first month orders. So given that there's been no change, you would expect that there should be, given that there's been no treatment, there should be no change in frequency if this is a, a an approach which is sound. Um, so this shows the distribution in percentage differences between um, those random users and their lookalikes. So you can see it's pretty normally distributed around a 0% change, which is good. Um, and basically what this allows us to conclude is that with this approach and with there being no treatment and with the sample size of 10,000 users, 95% um, of the time, the uh, uplift in frequency or the change in frequency is less than 11% plus 11%. So any change greater than 11%, we can say is down to the treatment if there is a treatment. Um, so this allows us to understand the significance of the approach. So this is what the uh, rolling 28-day average order frequency looks like for one of those random selections and their lookalikes. So this period before the first step change is the pre-period before we've matched them. Then we match them, and on one of the conditions was that on that date they have to have placed an order, which is why it jumps upwards. And then they follow a very similar trajectory. And because we're looking at a rolling 28-day period, it drops down at day 28 because we're no longer including that first order. But essentially, the takeaway here is that they, they follow a, a very similar trend, trend. So arguably, those lookalikes are, are a good control for that, for that random selection, given that there's been no, no treatment. And when you compare this to what we see with Delivery Plus, so I've removed the y-axis here and moved things a little bit, but basically the trajectory is very different um, and the uplift is greater than 11%, which allows us to um, confidently say that Delivery Plus is driving a decent uplift in frequency for those who sign up. Um, but we know that it's not perfect. So I've touched on some of the issues that we faced, um, the first of which was the seasonality differences. When we were using international lookalikes, we weren't accounting for those very different behaviors around our different global markets. So we tried to mitigate that by using the in-market pairings, but through doing that, we again introduced, those, we introduced that selection bias, which to mitigate, we, we attempted to collab calibrate by reducing that difference so that it was in line with what we'd historically seen. And when we first started using this, we weren't really sure about how we would calculate significance. So to do that, we've, we've run historical simulations to understand better whether this approach is actually something that we can use. And it's likely that if we continue to use this approach, we'll, we'll come across more problems and that selection bias issue may become a bigger issue. Um, but the good thing about it being post-treatment is it means you can 
you're quite flexible to changing it over time if for whatever reason the business goes into a new dire direction, we can update the methodology.